Carol Arnold earned his PhD in speech and English literature at the University of Iowa in 1942. From 1942 to 45, he served as a non-commissioned officer in the Army Air Corps Intelligence in the U.S. and Panama. In 1946, he took a position at Cornell University where he ultimately became professor and chair of the Department of Speech and Drama. In 1963, he left Cornell to become professor of speech communication at Penn State, the position from which he retired as an emeritus professor. He was author of some 50 scholarly articles and chapters and author or co-author of eight books, which was quite an accomplishment in those days. He served a term as editor of communication monographs and in 1968 was co-founder of the journal Philosophy and Rhetoric. In 1970, as chair of the Speech Communication Association Research Board, he was one of the co-planners of the incredibly important Wing Spread Conference on Research Directions and Speech Communication, which continues to influence scholarly <coughs> inquiry in the field. When he retired from Penn State, he was named by the field as teacher of the field. In 1994, the Carol C. Arnold Distinguished Lecture was established by the Administrative Committee of NCA to honor its namesake, to be delivered in plenary session each year at the annual name meeting of the association and to feature the most accomplished researchers in the field. One of the duties of the first vice president, and it's great duty, is to select the Arnold Lecture with the stipulations that the lecturer should be a, a scholar of undisputed merit who has already been recognized as such, a person whose recent research is as vital and suggestive as his earlier work, and a researcher whose work meets or exceeds I think mostly exceeds, <laughs> the scholarly standards of the academy at large. The purposes of the Arnold Lecture, said its founders, are to inspire not only by words, but by intellectual deeds, and to make the members of the association better informed by having one of its best professional professionals think aloud in our presence. It's a pleasure to introduce the 20th Carol C. Arnold Lecturer, who will be thinking aloud in our presence. The A. Craig Baird Professor of Communication Studies at the University of Iowa, John Durham Peters. John earned his BA in English and MA in Speech Communication at the University of Utah and his PhD in Communication Theory and Research at Stanford. John is interested in media and cultural history, communication and social theory, and understanding communication in its broad historical, religious, philo philosophical, and technological contexts. He has written extensively about the history of communication. Certainly most well known to most of us is his must read 1999 book, Speaking Into the Air, A History of the Idea of Communication, which was a recipient of the NCAA's Wine and Wicheld's Award for Distinguished Scholarship. <clears throat> Another of his fascinating works, Courting the Abyss, Free Speech and the Liberal Tradition, addresses the history of freedom of expression and its troubled and, troubled and troubling embrace of evil and it was the recipient of NCA's Heyman Award for Distinguished Scholarship in Freedom of Expression. Breaking news is that his latest book is out, The Marvelous Cloud, Toward a Philosophy of Elemental Media. I love his titles. Don't you? <clears throat> John has published nearly 100 articles and chapters, as well as many reviews and interviews. He's a highly decorated teacher, having won several teaching and mentoring awards at Iowa. He served as director of graduate studies and department chair there, difficult duty, and as highly sought, out, not, sought after not just for invited lectures, but also to do the hard and unglamorous work of department promotion and grant reviewing. John's work is incisive and visionary, expansive and complex. He's a perfect choice for our important critical self-evaluation as a field during this centennial year. I hope you will let him know how truly honored we are to have him think aloud with us at this year's Carol C. Arnold Distinguished Lecturer on these provocative questions. What is knowledge for and what does communication have to do with it? John Durham Peters. Thank you very much. 
Damas y caballeros, friends, colleagues, it's a great honor to be here and a great burden also. Um, my, my book on the marvelous clouds is not out till spring, actually, but I'm deeply grateful to Carol Blair for the, for the invitation. And I do feel a bit of honor and burden at the same time. Since my first published article in a communication journal nearly three decades ago, I've been a skeptic or a dissident about professionalized knowledge including the very idea of a discipline of communication studies. And so I confess to feeling some dissonance as I, as I consider how to celebrate the 100th anniversary of one of communication studies' premier professional associations. To be sure, what began 100 years ago in this city one Saturday morning in 19, November of 1914 as the National Association of Academic Teachers of Public Speaking was a milestone. Few people in the history of this planet have understood so deeply what the human capacity for speech entails. Much honorable and sincere work has been done under the banner of NCA since, and I would be helpless if I had to detail its considerable collective accomplishments. Let us toast to all us logos animals, as animals endowed with speech, as Aristotle called us. So. Applaud to the Logos animals. <laughs> and you might be disappointed. Um, the illustrated lecture was invented in the 19th century. Uh, the genre of my performance will be a much older one, which is a speech. <laughs> no pictures. I could do pictures, but we're not, we're not doing pictures tonight. Carol Arnold, like many key figures in the NCA tradition, had an interdisciplinary vision and thought that studying speech required us to study the processes by which human beings apprehend truths about themselves and their environment. This vision, as I've studied it for tonight, strikes me as remarkably fresh and the old art is still very much alive. Taking a cue from this vision, I want to ponder the institutional habitat in which we humans apprend apprehend such truths, namely the university. By considering the sometimes contradictory norms and ideals that govern our work as scholars and teachers, I hope to contribute to renewal for the next 100 years. I do not expect all of you to agree with some of my views. Consider this a minority re report from one who has spent his life hanging around and thinking about universities. The university is one of the great inventions of the past 1,000 years. As Michael Shudson notes, quote, the university itself is one of the greatest communication technologies ever invented, close quote. As an institution, a set of program genres and a shifting set of rather fickle audiences, the university has been an institution of great fascination for a long line of media theorists, including me. Let us, in the spirit of Harold Innes, the great Canadian historian and theorist of communication, explore the university as a medium of communication. It is surprising that scholars so rarely reflect on the university compared to other culture industries. Despite much high-quality research on the history, philosophy, rhetoric, and sociology of academic knowledge, maybe it is time to show the zoo to the animals as a recent volume on the university edited by Barbie Zelizer suggests. That was Monroe Price's quip. We all get the appeal and excitement of the university. I love the architecture, the open green spaces for taking a nap or tossing a frisbee on the pastoral American campus, the gothic splendor of Oxbridge, or the densely packed cityscapes of the university of, universities of Amsterdam, Athens, or Helsinki where I spent, spent the last year. Universities are places of possibility, little bubbles of utopia, full of young people facing an openness of life choice. Destinations of learning beckon to us like ships in the harbor. For me, the university is a family business. I'm the fourth in a line of five generations of professors so far. More expected. <laughs> 
I am as susceptible as anyone to the sentimental nostalgia about college days that has been one of the chief cultural and economic achievements of the American universities over the past century. A September day when the morning air is just a bit crisp, the leaves on the trees are on the verge of turning, and the students are milling about before the semester's grind has begun. What a heady brew that is. Or the beginning of the lecture when the visiting professor ascends the podium and you sit with expectation that some light will be cast upon this big dark universe. What a thrill that is. Unfortunately, not very often fulfilled. <laughs> what a place. I can't imagine the world without universities. The central analytic, analytic dilemma is the clash between the university's official ideal of progress and its cycles of regeneration. As a young child growing up in Virginia for a period, I recall being deeply perplexed when I asked about the bugs that were making so much racket, and I was told about the 17-year locust. The insects, I learned, had emerged from their long slumber to mate and to die, leaving the next generation to rise again in 17 years. What was the point of this rinse, lather, and repeat cycle? <laughs> to understand the meaning of the 17-year locust would be, I now think, to understand the meaning of life. Are we scholars not a bit like locusts or in our proverbial conclusion that more research is needed? <laughs> How do we square the festivals of regeneration that govern academic life, such as 100-year anniversaries, with our professed ideal of ever new knowledge? Is progress or renewal our basic ideal? Well, if we want to talk about ideals, we should talk about some facts. The university is in crisis today. The problems are well known. We face the erosion of tenure-track positions and the imposition of management models and accounting systems that increase transparency, but not necessarily intelligence. We should maybe update Foucault's quip, transparency is a trap, like visibility. Diminished funding leads to increased tuition fees, the aggressive pursuit of international student dollars on my campus as Chinese students, probably as same as many of, of yours, and a shift of general education courses to community colleges, which risks weakening the core humanities curriculum. Academic publishing follows an absurd economic model, with publicly funded research being given away for free to privately owned corporations, which then sell it back to universities at enormous profit. It's ridiculous. Changing habits of reading, writing, and learning in a digital age push fundamental realignments in pedagogy, libraries, and informa information management. I think my students now read in terms of screenfuls. In his plea for the university tradition from 1944, Innes was worried about the state, the encroachments of the state. Political pr uh, pressures, for sure, are real today we should probably worry more about the market. Scholarship, which was long a communist enterprise, as sociologist Andrew Abbott notes, is being increasingly claimed by capitalist interests. Google, Microsoft, Bell Labs, the military, political think tanks, tanks, and corporations adorned with chief knowledge officers don't need academics to persuade them of the value of research for its own sake they understand its value all too well. Indeed, some of the strongest advocates for open-ended learning come from business. TED Talks, for example, are symptomatic of a culture among high-tech elites that mixes intelligence and money with some California cool stirred in for garnish. You don't wear a tie when you're giving a TED, TED Talk. So I was so touched the other day when I received a personal email from Walter Isaacson inviting me to attend the Vanity Fair New Establishment Summit in San Francisco, where I could hobnob with innovators and disruptors on the surprisingly fresh theme of the age of innovation <laughs> for a mere $5,000. My desire to live in the ruling class does not reach that amount. Thank you very much. But I mean, innovation is the trope which unites business, I mean, 
in intelligence and a, and a learning. University presidents and deans today are fundraisers first, and only secondarily academic leaders, let alone visionaries. Money is just as unevenly distributed in universities as it is everywhere else in our society, with great luxury at the top and scraping and scrimping at the bottom. Consider these words, quote, the great event in the history of an institution is now likely to be a big gift rather than a new investigation or the development of a strong and vigorous teacher. The imagination is taken more or less by the thought of this force, vague but potent. The emotions are enkindled by grandiose conceptions of the possibilities inherent in money." Close quote. That was philosopher John Dewey in 1902, a few miles south of here um, at the University of Chicago, recently funded recently founded, thanks um, in large part to Rockefeller's oil money. I mean, as we've heard from Carol's opening remarks, money is important. It's a great servant, horrible master. Innes believed that the university had always been surrounded by villains and distractions. Paperwork and workflow, email and PowerPoint, impact factors and assessment, sitting in front of screens all day, writing letters of recommendation, yeah, fall and November. Um, when did we all agree to this? <laughs> of course, none of this is new to any of you. Such topics are our daily bread. A passion for our work goes together with a culture of complaint and cynicism, reflecting society-wide ambivalence about the professions. What accounts for this sweet and sour mix? As George Bernard Shaw once said, quote, every person who has mastered a profession is a skeptic concerning it, and consequently a revolutionist. I wish he was always right. Me gusta agua. Complaints can carry, however, an implicit inclination toward truth and justice. They imply ideals we can use to hold the institution accountable. James Carey, following Innes, observed that the institution, like journalism, are similar institutions. Both have the job of delivering truth, but both are marked by routinized modes of production, ruled by money and status, and torn by petty squabbles. And yet somehow, truth does get shaken out of the bushes every now and then. Let us celebrate these sightings and figure out how to make them more frequent. Nothing else really matters in the tremendous buzz of academic work if we are not discovering and disseminating truth. Let's face it, there's something profoundly, and maybe even delightfully absurd about our whole enterprise, like that of the locusts. Despite the urgency of the current situation, human, human problems in higher education are perennial, and I know of no better vantage point to observe the human circus than the campus. A glance at classical rhetorical education impresses one how steadily the academic drama has rotated through a few steady themes. As my colleague in classics at Iowa, Craig Gibson, shows, ancient professors were beset by the temptations of celebrity, jealousy, and money. And ancient students were tempted by booze, love affairs, and laziness. The pursuit and spread of truth both then and now involve charismatic teachers and ambitious students interested in money, influence, study abroad programs, letters of recommendation, the building of professional networks, and careers in law, politics, and business. Lack of discipline among students and melancholia among professors were both well-known hazards. Now, on island habitats, island habitat, sorry, as the biogeographers tell us, organisms tend to evolve to extremes. An academic life, an island, has a cast of characters as diverse as Galapagos finches. In the words of my late colleague Bruce Gronbeck, to whose memory this lecture is dedicated, and who was a dancing master of lightness and irony about his own craft, the university is a state institution for smart people. 
got to think about it for a sec. Yeah. <laughs> a long history of academic satire stretches from the sophists, from the Greek sophists and comic playwrights, through Erasmus and Nietzsche to the post-war campus novel. Humanism started as, among other things, a criticism of the scholarly vices. We are a tribe with curious ticks, and we produce loamy mounds of material, ripe for comic and loving treatment. The cast of characters is by no means unique to communication studies, but it's common to the university habitat. And any resemblance of the following figures to persons living or dead is purely coincidental. We all know the empire builder, the self-promoter who just may have written a detailed Wikipedia entry about his or her contributions to scholarship. <laughs> we know the earth mother therapist. We know the brilliant scholar with lots to say who publishes too little, and the churner with little to say who publishes too much. We know the mentor tormentor, the chill nouveau groovo dude, the young striver dressed for success, the sleek, mean, grant-getting machine, the old burned-out volcano who checked out years ago but refuses to stop saying super smart, disruptive things just to show that he was once a silverback, <laughs> the intriguer straight out of a Renaissance court, the indefatigable service contributor, the wizened, churlish gnome, too smart and too fearsome to disrespect. The glossolaliac theory spinner. The earnest grinder, self-citing articles published decades ago. The bean-counting administrator. The aloof aristocrat, trying to stay above the battle, but unsuccessfully concealing disdain for his colleagues. The diva. The hipster armed with superfine distinctions about food and politics. The Facebook maven contentedly churning on the latest outrage. And best of all, the mensch. And I hope that you have known as many as I have. Of course, the diversity of roles is one of the great things about the academic game. There are so many positions to play. Let's see. Yes, great. So how do we reconcile the university's claim to hold all knowledge with this diverse cast of characters and endless varieties of isms and approaches? How do we square the comic vision of the university as a zoo with the lofty ideal of discovering truth and disseminating that strange thing we casually call knowledge? What is knowledge and what is it for? These are not, obviously, easy questions, as 24 centuries of philosophical debate on the topic show. But I take knowledge to be a species and individual requirement. All humans by nature desire to know, said Aristotle, a desire that can be erotic in its intensity. Jürgen Habermas's distinction has not, to my mind, a definition, I'm sorry, has not, to my mind, been surpassed. Knowledge, he said, is tied to three fundamental human interests. The theoretical interest in controlling nature, the critical interest in fighting power, both internal or external, and the interpretive interest in understanding each other. We need knowledge, in other words, for prediction, for liberation, for communication. Knowledge, says Habermas, is in intertwined with, quote, the objective self-formative process of the human species. Gotta love the Germans. Bildungsprozess. It's the best thing ever. Note those words, objective and species, which will be important in what follows. Yet, any given member of the species can only possess a thimbleful of the ocean of all that there is to know. Where is knowledge located? I mean, where, where, where do you find the thing? Um, perhaps it's partly located in other people. Most of human knowledge consists to wax briefly Rumsfeldian, of unknown knowns. That's Rumsfeld improved by Zizek, but anyway. Um, <laughs> unknown knowns, something known to someone, but not known to me. Knowledge heats our homes and keeps our airplanes afloat, feeds our bodies, and makes this gathering possible. 
embedded in every shoelace or laptop, every light bulb or bottle cap, are years of labor and research, most of which we are privileged to ignore or take for granted. Modern life presupposes encyclopedias of knowledge that we, do not, we haven't read and cannot explain. Our technological infrastructures and social infrastructures embody accumulated knowledge, unknown knowns. Just as nature itself is rife with knowledge we haven't even thought to wonder about, call that unknown knowns. So if knowledge exists in mind, scattered among the individuals of the species, it also exists in matter. Other species engage in practices that shape their habitats. But humans are the only creatures on Earth that I know of who have harnessed materials to store intelligence. This domain of externalized mind we can call techne, technology, art, culture, writing, know-how, libraries, databases, the web of science, the internet, or why not, the university. More strongly, such material forms not only store mind, but enable it. Said Albert Einstein, my pencil and I are smarter than I am. I am persuaded by diverse arguments from actor network theory, philosophy of embodied mind, and German and Canadian media theory that knowledge and inscription technologies are radically co-constituted. That's about as jargony as I'll get, I promise. Without the flat laboratories enabled by, by writing, no mathematics beyond simple arithmetic could exist. And the same is true for other forms of knowledge. Of course, rhetorical theory is long understood from the sophist forward how instruments work upon our thoughts. And this is, a, I think, a key contribution of communication studies and media studies uh, in general. Now, to speakers of English, a language which is shot through with empiricist assumptions, the thought of mind or knowledge embodied objectively in matter can sound strange. Karl Popper called it World Three. It's an improvement on the third world, which is his, his first version. But anyway, Karl Popper called it World Three, a universe of objects whose distinctive feature is that it is improved by criticism. Artifacts can possess knowledge that humans do not. The Rosetta Stone stored knowledge of ancient Egyptian language before it was deciphered. And there are in our libraries, archives, and attics inhuman mounds of knowledge undisturbed by any human knower. We can call the archive of human knowledge following Hannah Arendt immortality, the world of durable human things. But not everything recorded is a signal. A lot of it is noise. And almost everything that was once signal becomes noise with the passage of time and entropy. Much knowledge, such as the weather, has a rapid sell-by date. The history of libraries from Alexandria to Google show the struggle to organize data. The world is full of garbage heaps of forgotten learning. The treasures there are accessible only by costly time or labor. Yeah. Surprise, you didn't know that. OK. Let me offer the first premise of a syllogism. All academics are mortal. <laughs> Sometimes it's good to be as basic as possible. This fact has enormous implications. Knowledge among mortal beings takes a very different shape than it would among immortals or beings with different lifespans than ours. Every choice of what to read or learn is also a choice of what not to read or what not to learn. How dizzy it is to walk into a good bookstore. Schopenhauer said, if you could only buy the time to read the book when you buy the book. <laughs> Learning exacts both transaction costs and opportunity costs. Because knowledge dwells partly in mortals, its value and meaning is time-bound and depends on temporal or narrative context. There is no knowledge apart from the struggle of conception, gestation, and delivery, as feminist philosophy tells us. Socrates saw philosophy as midwifery. The biblical term to know with its carnal and epistemological fusion, points to the embodied stake in knowledge. Every time somebody dies, much knowledge goes to the grave. And we could not even begin to measure just how much we forget every day. 
Perhaps even the NSA could not ingest the vast clouds of all that we daily flush into oblivion. It's a comforting thought. One medieval scholar in 1255 observed something interesting, saying, the multitude of books, the shortness of time, and the slipperiness of memory do not allow all things which are written to be equally retained in the mind. Things have changed so much. Sarcastic. OK. <laughs> I need agua again. Excuse me. Historian Anne Blair, who supplies this gem, points out that the medieval and Renaissance worry about the overabundance of books naturally led to the writing of more books to manage the flood, such as anthologies, encyclopedias, and compendia. And we still have the habit of producing more data to reduce a glut of data. Scholars always face the pressures of too many books and too few resources, notably of time, memory, or money. And we have a variety of practices for coping with them. One is proverbs, actually. I mean, I think expertise boils down to proverbs in some ways. Garbage in, garbage out, apples and oranges. If you have a hammer, everything looks like a nail. The personal is political. Hegemony is leaky. Follow the money. The devil's in the details. It's a lot of wisdom there. Knowledge among mortals, thus, includes both contingent and lasting matter. So much of it is surrounded by uncertainty. Basic research can never tell in advance what is a dud and what is a Nobel Prize. Any serious scientific undertaking has to risk its own legitimacy. The inability to predict the future enables the experimental method. Most experiments confirm the null hypothesis. Knowledge is open to revision, invalidation, debates, scoops, priority disputes, failure, and mess. Knowledge is the domain of failure as much as of certified tr truth. Experience a once a word once more closely tied to experiment is the collection of dead ends. Okay, so the standard of novelty means very different things if we're talking about the vast externalized data storage media, such as libraries, and biologically mortal human beings, especially if we're talking about the difference between the species and the individual. For the discoverer and the student, almost all knowledge is new. For the material record, that forms both the artificial and the natural universe, almost all, or perhaps all knowledge, is already given. Indeed, new knowledge is a rather anthropocentric notion. Perhaps, hang with me for a second, the universe already knows everything that scientific research will, already, will ever discover, an idea taken to extreme in Plato's idea that all learning is simply a matter of unforgetting. So the criterion has to be knowledge that is new for somebody, in this case, human beings. OK, so when we talk about research, the typical discourse is it has to be new. It has to be new knowledge. The highest standard in research is it has to be new for everybody. For a Nobel Prize, in theory, you're the first person in the history of the human race to know something. Being second doesn't count which is one reason why scientific journals will publish submission and acceptance dates, even though we know from the history of science that discoveries are multiple and priori priority disputes are often fierce. Gloria can hinge, glory can hinge on a single day. In teaching and learning, in contrast, there is no loss in being the second or the billionth person to know something. The norm for research is new to everyone. The norm for teaching is new to someone. In fact, though, the standard of new to everyone is almost always unattainable. Most of what counts as new research is new for someone, not new for everyone. In tenure and promotion cases, the question is, is the work a contribution to the field? That is, are you first among your peers? This means that most research is actually closer to teaching. That, that is not new knowledge for all, but new knowledge for some. Now, by adopting the guild model of peer review as the standard of truth, academic professionalism in the decades around 1900 secured an autonomous place for inquiry, a place relatively immune to the meddling of church, state, and market. But it also made one's colleagues, rather than one's fellow humans, the appropriate judge of knowledge. 
I have a slight problem with this, as you'll see. The results have been mixed. I recently listened to a talk by a moral philosopher arguing that moral intuitions were embedded in social contexts and personal histories. A point that I thought everybody in the world must have known, except for moral philosophers. <laughs> People within fields can make careers bringing in insights that would only be news to a sheltered community. The, the literature can be a device to constrain focus enough to generate novelty. By shrinking the reference group, specialties manage the unbearable pressure of newness. From the 1920s to today, this is as um, Andrew Abbott points this out, um, a period in which the population of scholars has multiplied by 10. It's been observed in many different decades that there's a relatively constant ratio between the numbers of, number of journals and number of scholars. That is 100 to about 150. Abbott calls this bounded novelty, which is a lot easier to achieve than species novelty. The question is not newness for all humans who ever lived, or even all scholars, but your field mates. Contribution to knowledge thus gets it's much more manageable, much more uh, manageable population size. Now, of course, the satirists of academic life have made great sport of specialization. Norbert Wiener, Mr. Interdisciplinary, in 1948, I'll, I'll just read a chunk. Um, Today there are a few scholars who can call themselves mathematicians or physicists or biologists without restriction. A man, we'd want to add a woman of course, may be a topologist or a coopterist, someone who studies beetles, I just found out. The problem is, uh, Wiener continues, the scholar will regard the next subject as something belonging to his or her colleague three doors down the corridor and will consider any interest in it on his own part as an unwarrantable breach of privacy. In some ways, criticizing specialization is a cheap shot, since nobody can know everything, and any learning requires a trip up a very steep learning curve that takes a lot of sacrifice of time and money. So I don't want to be cheap about this. But I think that Max Weber was right when he said that specialization was both inevitable and tragic. Professionalism is great if it means the highest standards of truth seeking, but not if it means being exclusively oriented to one's peers rather than to general human questions. I agree with James Carey on this long, longish quote. The principal effect of professionalism is to erode the moral basis of society. It does this because the professions insist that each inhabits a particular moral universe peculiar unto itself, in which the standards and judgments exercised are those not of the general society and its moral point of view, but of a distinctive code. That's Kerry. Now, more agua. Okay. There is a tendency among scholars, certainly not only in, in communication study, this is university-wide, to create what are called online link farms. Small universes of mutual citation that thereby raise their profile on Google searches. Another strategy of managing the vastness of knowledge, and I mentioned it, is Proverbs. Um, another strategy is what I would call hipster theory, in which young, cool, mostly male scholars dismissed, dismiss vast territories of scholarship for not being hip to whatever distinction they treasure. We have so many strategies for narrowing the scope. Superstars, canons, recency, the latest, of course. Um, all these things focus our reading lists. But the claim to jurisdictional monopoly, which is the essential claim of professionalism, is belied by the fact that there is often more variety within a single field than between fields, if we were to run an, an analysis of variance. Vast patches of the humanities and soft social sciences in recent decades have been branches of Foucault studies or cultural studies. A faculty member is more often likely to share intellectual interests with someone in a different department on the same campus than with a departmental colleague next door. Have academic disciplines today become something like the record album in the age of iTunes or the journal issue in the age of JSTOR? It's something we can debate. 
Um, a weak point of academic specialism is synthesis. There are the old jokes about the university as a multitude of warring specialties held together by either complaints about parking or a shared central heating system. I love the motto of the British Statistical Society in the early 1800s. They accumulated vast avalanches of printed numbers, as Ian Hacking says. The motto was, Ali is exterendum, which means to be threshed out by others. Charles Bazerman has famously analyzed the rhetoric built into the APA style manual as embodying an ideology of incremental encyclopedism. That is, anonymous cumulative labor all leading toward higher synthesis that never comes. Now, there's lots of noble, great work. Please, please don't uh, misunderstand me. And though I don't endorse the ideology of, of Nobel Prizes, my point is that the, for the university, the species has to remain the ultimate test. If it's only exciting to your field mates, then it's not a serious contribution. I've never understood how scholars can accept turf as a principle of intellectual life. Yes, gregarious animals are territorial, but the ideal of scholarship should be more transcendent. In my view, we should take the mission of the university absolutely seriously, but perhaps not ta ever take individuals' field seriously. Discipline should be internal, not institutional. Now, I expect many of you to disagree vigorously. Reasonable people will disagree on this. Now, the ideal of progress in the Nobel Prize may be problematic, but there is a clue in natural science, which I think we can learn from, and that is the norm of species address, or a relevance to humanity at large. Many great works of scientific innovation, Darwin's Origin of Species most notably, were both scientific milestones and masterworks of popular science. I think communication studies should reorient its relation to science. It is a dead end to take science as either a foe that destroys understanding or as, a, um, as the one way to truth to be emulated. To be too telegraphic, it is now clear that the positivist story not only got the humanities wrong, it also got a lot about the natural sciences wrong. We worked so hard to show that positivism did not apply to the world of interpretation that we forgot that it didn't really apply to the world of causes and effects and correlations either. Quantum physics and cosmology and evolutionary biology, as I understand them, are all good examples of this. Knowledge of the world in all of its strangeness should be our business. And communication studies could be, and I hope it will be, in the next 100 years, a place for a fresh confluence of, of the humanities, social sciences, natural sciences, and the arts. So how can we achieve a species address? I believe such an address is built into the structure of the university. So I've told you that research is, is really like teaching. I'm going to tell you that teaching is really like research. The undergraduate students articulate the species interest. They are the public realm. They offer the general point of view. We are all undergraduates in almost all fields but our own. The smartest people on earth, as well as those who make policy and decisions, it's a contrast, that affect all of us, have at best an undergraduate understanding in all but a few fields. The question of how to address undergraduates is also thus the question of how to address the species, or at least the literate reading public. The core of the university tradition, says Innes, is general studies, the concern for knowledge as a whole. Why do we waste this on the young? As a species, we need knowledge in general, not just in specialty. The question of how to teach undergrads is also the question of how to speak to humanity at large. Note that intellectual inquiry is most difficult among the basic questions, not the advanced questions. You can go to law school and get a very precise understanding of torts, but never a precise understanding of, ju of what justice is. You can go to medical school and get a very precise understanding of the 11 cranial nerves, but what the heck health is, no one's going to tell you. We can talk in this room splendidly about hegemony or re relational turbulence, but none of us are very good about talking about what communication is. Innes said the point of the university tradition is to resist the claims of specialisms. 
So the university, as Inna said, is surrounded by villains, but there's so many temptations from within. Hallway politics, email intrigue, administrative service, salary comparisons, lamentations about this or that program not being continued or funded. William James, in a sarcastic 1903 essay called The PhD Octopus, which you should all read, enumerated the secondary evils surrounding what he called the doctor monopoly in teaching. Experience has proved, this is James, experience has proved that great as the love of truth may be among men and among women, it can still be made greater by adventitious rewards. Soren Kierkegaard argued in contrast that authors should have to pay for the privilege of writing. The regents may be ridiculous and the dean unfeeling and your colleague obstreperous, but once you're in the classroom, in the lab or the library, you still have the uninterruptible pleasure of seeking truth in some form, of writing a steep learning curve, of adding to the sum total of life in the universe. Why do we spend so many ways avoiding our core work? What stops us from talking about the precession of the equinoxes, the law, the law of contract, the use of the ablative case in Latin, how logarithms or t-tests work, how to play triplets, or the poetry of Emily Dickinson? It's cheap. It's great. The truth is always hard and always new. So I come to the end. One more page. Communication belongs to the species. As communication scholars, I fear we have been too lazy, too unambitious, too untrue to the grandeur inherent in our subject matter, too ready to talk to each other, and too slow to harvest knowledge from everywhere. I end with a call for a less sheltered life, less prone to follow the fashion, more concern with inquiry, discovery, with truth. We should be lighting up the worldwide conversation, not just be talking to each other. There are indeed, of course, pers persuasive arguments in favor of provincialism, such as the classic speech by Josiah Royce, given at the University of Iowa in 1908. It's a great speech. Provincialism is resistance to modernity. It's where you find community. I get it. But I still lean toward a more cosmopolitan direction. In the next 100 years, I'd like to see a Nobel Prize or a Pulitzer Prize won by a member of, of NCA. Not that the prize matters, but that the general address to humanity does. NCA needs to think, in my view, beyond its unexamined American orientation. The unearned premium that reading and writing in English gives us on a global scale, rather like the agricultural price supports that artificially jack up food prices in the Midwest and create global havoc for farmers in other, in other places. How a humanist can be functionally monolingual is something that I've never understood. We should step out of the empire and its blind spots and learn other languages. Knowledge ultimately is about humiliation rather than about empowerment. Wonder rather than pride should be the ruling academic virtue. Let us treasure the university but distrust all specialties. As Inna said, the university is in danger when it starts to think that it has the truth rather than that its mission is to seek the truth. Let us think big and take on climate change, big data, poverty, along with gender, globalization, and democracy. The 17-year locusts show us what it is to be alive in the now when they sing, mate, and prepare for the next generation. Knowledge and its diffusion is a species requirement. Communication and its study could, and I hope will, be a leader in this project. The truth is always new. That's what I came to say. Thank you for listening.